Lord says this. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would illuminate the words of this passage today. God, speak to us through them. Not that they were hearing us speak, not that we're hearing human words, but they were hearing the cry of your heart, the longing of your spirit, and the desire of you for our lives. Be lifted up and glorified in our presence today. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Um, we are working through a sermon series on what is sin. What does sin look like? How does it manifest itself in our lives? And how can we recognize it? And we come to this passage today, and maybe it seems a little random or arbitrary. And to be honest with you, it kind of, it kind of is, but not completely. Um, I was at a seminar on Thursday down at Messiah College for the day, and I was listening to uh, an author speak uh, for about six hours, Laurie and I were both there, about a book he wrote called Canoeing the Mountains, and it's how to navigate the church, how to lead the church um, through the post-Christian world that we're living in. You may not think we're living in a post-Christian world, but statistics actually bear that out. And so that's what the seminar was about. And you hear me rail against like um, electronics from time to time and social media and stuff like that, but I took great advantage of that while I was there. He was actually interesting, so it wasn't I was surfing the net or anything like that, but while he was speaking, he talked about another book that he read. The name of the book was called Change or Die, and the title of the book was actually the subject content of the book, and while he's talking about this book, I was like, man, this is outstanding. I really want to read this book. So while he was speaking, I hop on my phone, I get on Amazon, and 30 seconds later, the book was ordered. It showed up at my house on Friday. I'm like, this is outstanding, right? So one of the joys of uh, the technology that we share. So Change or Die came, and I started reading. Here's the premise of the book, Change or Die. It starts off talking about people who have been diagnosed with a medical condition. You know, a life-threatening medical condition. Maybe it's cloggage of your artery, blockage of the heart, things of that nature. But something that has to do with if you don't change your lifestyle, then your death is imminent. And it's a death that's before your time. I'm not talking about somebody who's like 97 years old and who's eating bacon and sausage every day for the rest of their life. Like, I'm sorry, that's just life taking its course. But if it happens in the 40s or 50s, it's a different story, right? And then the doctor has to give an unfortunate diagnosis. And a lot of times the doctor will call the patient out of the room that you're in, you know, the little, and then maybe, maybe you go to the doctor's office, you know, the nice thing where he's got the big leather couch and the chairs and sits behind the desk and talks to you. He's got all the degrees up on the wall so you know what he's talking about and things of that nature. And he will give you the diagnosis. Here's what, you're, here's what we're looking at. Here's where you need to change your life to get to where you want to be as far as longevity goes. Now, this book is called Change or Die because research has found that when a doctor does that, when a doctor pulls somebody aside, when they have that diagnosis, when they lay it out before them that you need to change your life or consequences are going to be difficult, here's what research has found. 90% of the people that meet with that doctor will not change, even if their life is on the line. Within less than two years, 90% of the people who have the opportunity to live longer if they create a lifestyle change choose to not make that change. That figure blew me away. And I'm like, I really want to read this book. 
I want to find out why we don't want to change, why we don't want to move forward, why we don't want to do those things. Because it's a pretty amazing statistic if you think about it, right? For some reason, that person will choose not to change. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's a lack of self-worth, right? They don't see the value in themselves. Maybe it's, maybe it's I want to live the way I want to live and nobody's going to tell me how to do that. Maybe they want to be comfortable and do the things that they've done all their lives. Whatever the choice may be, we can all agree that many of us are resistant and hesitant to change. And maybe you're thinking, why is that important to us today when we talk about Matthew chapter 5, right? Here's what we have today. When Jesus is speaking here, when he's giving his sermon on the mount, which is what this passage is taken out of, Jesus has really given us a new perspective, isn't he? He, he, he has said in Matthew chapter 5 before us here, in chapter 5, verse seven, 17, he says, I have not come to abolish the law and prophets. The law and prophets referring to the Old Testament law, the law that Moses brought, right? The Ten Commandments, the, what we talked about last week and all that stuff. He said, I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. So what does it mean to fulfill? He says, when, he, when I've come to fulfill them, it's take what Moses brought, which was an incomplete law, and make it better, bringing it to its ultimate conclusion. Okay? So when Jesus says, I've come to fulfill them, that's what he's saying in the passage that we're reading through today. And you hear it a lot. We just picked up two little sections in Matthew chapter 5. Read through Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Here's what you hear Jesus say. You have heard it said, referring to the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law, but I say, you have heard it said this, but I say this. You have heard it said, long ago, do not commit murder. But I say, you have heard it said long ago, do not commit adultery. But I say, and when you hear that word, you kind of pucker up a little bit, don't you? You go, oh, man, this is going to be tough. Jesus' words usually are kind of difficult, aren't they? But when he's changing what we think we know or what they think they knew when they heard that for the first time, it's going to be difficult. You have heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Yeah, we read about that last week in the Ten Commandments. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Ooh. How about this one? You have heard it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Are you comfortable with what Jesus is saying here? Does that make you feel warm and fuzzy inside? Guys, again, it's a new perspective that's being set before us here today. Jesus is upping the ante. He's saying, you have some personal responsibility here. It's not just about our outward actions that everybody can see. It's about the condition of our hearts. Guys, we can fake a lot, can't we? We're pretty good at it. Almost everybody in here is, right? We can fake it. We can be pretty successful at it. And we can have people buy into our misdirection. We can have people buy into what we're selling. Guys, there was a whole Seinfeld episode based upon this premise, right? And we're not going to get into that today. But how does your life look different to those on the exterior? When people see you from the outside, how does it look different from what's going on inside? Guys, most of us can get through life pretty easily obeying the sixth and seventh commandments, can't they? I mean, Thou shalt not murder. I, I got that one down pretty good. Right? I, I'm, I'm solid there. Right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Check, check. But that's not what Jesus is saying here, is it? It's not about what you do or don't do on the exterior. It's about the condition of your heart. Murdering somebody. Actually killing another person. We put that in a different category than just being angry with somebody, don't we? Committing adultery outside of marriage. We put that in another different category than just looking at someone lustfully, don't we? We don't say that we do. No, Pastor Scott, we look at them all the same. I'm calling bull, right? You know it. You know it, and I know it too. Because it's not about the exterior. That's what Jesus is saying here. Is he serious, right? Well, we could look at verses 29 and 30, and they're kind of weird, right? If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to lose an eye than to be thrown into the fires of hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better to lose your right hand than to be thrown into the fires of hell. Here's where it gets difficult. I think we can all agree that that language is figurative. But there's also literal truth to it, isn't there? Would you rather lose an eye or spend eternity apart from God? Would you rather lose a hand or spend eternity apart from God? 
Like, it, it, it's, it's kind of sad and scary at the same time. Most of you voted, or at least thought about voting, or at least knew there was elections on Tuesday, so good job, right? But there's a Babylon Bee article. For those of you who don't know what the Babylon Bee is, it's a Christian satirical website. They come up with satirical stories, and I think a lot of them are hilarious. But I actually read one this week that was so good, the satire was so good because it was true. And when you get something that's funny because it's true, and you can't even do anything about it, you go... Wow, they nailed it. Let me read to you what the Babylon Bee wrote this week about the elections. They said, Christians voting their conscience have quite a choice this election day with the two major political parties. With the Republicans, Christians have the option of declaring all their beliefs hollow by supporting a party that pays lip service to Christians while it's full of lies, greed, hostile to foreigners, and a cavalier attitude about war. Christians can especially show their hypocrisy by throwing yet more support behind a president who stands abhorrent to just about every moral standard they've previously claimed important while he makes only a marginal effort to show a support of faith. <laughs> Man, that hurts, don't it, Republicans? How about this one? With the Democrats, though, Christians can basically opt for suicide. By giving support to a party that is actively against them, having shown they are very willing to make Christians face trial and lose their jobs for holding the same moral beliefs they've held for thousands of years. The only religious, religious belief the Democrats seem to hold dear is that every knee shall bow at the altar of abortion. Ouch. No one hurts, doesn't it, Democrats? So where's the satire? <laughs> right? Like, there's supposed to be something funny in there. But when I read it, I'm like, that is painful. It's the perfect satirical article because from my point of view, almost the entire writing was pretty damning and true to both sides of the political aisle. And if you don't think so, I think you may want to wrap yourself away from politics and a little closer to God. That's just a suggestion. I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong. I'm just saying think about it. Guys, we can throw all the reasons we can think of as to why Jesus isn't serious about what he says here, right? We can remain uncomfortable about them. But the cold, hard truth is that there is some truth to these presents, to these concepts as well. I said it before. I don't think Jesus is asking you to gouge out an eye. I don't think he's asking you to cut off a hand. But think about this, right? And the reason I say that is because even somebody without, who can't see can still lust. Even somebody without a hand can still commit murder. I don't think he's literally telling you to do that. But I'm thinking we should struggle with the concepts that are presented before us today. Right? Why? Because sin is a heart condition. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2. All a man's ways seem right to him, but God, the Lord, weighs the heart. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, and turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Translation, the condition of your heart will be revealed through the way you live your life. The condition of your heart will be revealed through the way that you live your life. It's not about your words. It's not about your persona. It's not who, about who you put yourself out to be when we gather Sunday mornings together in church. Guys, you can fool most of the people. Heck, you can probably fool all the people. And you may be very, very good at it. To the point where you probably think you're getting away with it. But what does Proverbs 21.2 say? The Lord, not me, not Pastor Scott, not other congregation, the Lord weighs the heart. Ouch. Guys, just this last week, a famous Christian comedian was scheduled to go on a tour for a couple months. Right? He had to cancel his tour because it was found that over the course of the last seven years, he had sexually exploited five different women. Right? That's the ones we know about. He was a Christian comedian. Right? In many different ways, whether it was on the internet, whether it was texting stuff, whether it was actual engagement and encounters, women who were single, women who were married. He was a Christian comedian. How about this one? The very next day, there's a church in Illinois. We would call it a mega church. They actually fired their pastor in February because it was just, he was just being divisive, right? There was nothing sexual, but it was just about everything else. 
Then the next day, so Wednesday of this week, came out with an article about how they are not allowing him back in their midst. He's not allowed to come back and pastor with them if he wants to pastor another church, but he's not allowed back in their midst. Here's what the church says. He failed to meet the elder qualification laid out in Scripture. He, they attested that he had a pattern of being disruptive, insulting, belittling, and verbally bullying others, and improperly exercising positional and spiritual authority, as well as extravagant spending utilizing church resources resulting in personal benefit. Guys, this is a pastor of a huge church. When anybody would ask him his salary, he wouldn't tell them. In fact, the one quote he made one time is, I'd rather lose a thousand sheep than divulge my salary. Came out, he was earning $80,000 a month. That is $960,000 a year to pastor a church. So church board, y'all need to step up your game. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding, right? On top of that, he had an annual $1.2 million discretionary spending account. I wouldn't let him back in either unless he repented. Guys, these are Christian leaders. These are people that are on the forefront that are visual, that are representing the church. They faked it for a long time, right? Now, I'm not judging them. What I'm saying is their words, they faked it for a long time. So don't think that it's just about them, is it? Right? The list could go on. I could throw out pastors and leaders and, and all sorts of, of big Christians time after time that have used their power and faith to manipulate others for their gain. Right? And what they've done is they've taken the gospel of Christ, they've taken the word of God, and they've used it in a way that it was never intended. That's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about other leaders. My question is, what about you? You ever done that? Ever use the gospel for personal gain in your life? Now, I'm guessing that many of you have never exploited the gospel for sexual conquest. And I'm guessing that many of you have never exploited the gospel for massive financial gain in your life, right? How about leverage in a relationship? How about an attempt to win an argument or a debate? How about an attempt to look good on the outside? so that people don't really know what's going on inside. Because again, that's really what Christ is referring to here, isn't it? You have heard it said. This has been the law of the land since Moses was around. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the law. It's always been that way. That's our tradition. It's the way it's always been. It's who we are. We like to think that, don't we? But that's not exactly the truth either, is it? Because if that was the truth, then there would be no, word, no need for Jesus' words to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees found in Matthew chapter 23, where he figuratively lights them up one side and down the other because of their rules and regulations and how they held people hostage to it. Guys, we, we talked about the Ten Commandments last week, right? Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10 say this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work. That's pretty easy and straightforward stuff, isn't it? Of course it is. It's a piece of cake. Seems easy. Seems simple. But it wasn't for Christ. Right? The Pharisees. They see Jesus and his disciples walking through a grain field on a Sunday. The disciples are grabbing grains and eating them. And then the Pharisees are like, whoa, 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 Jesus, how do you defend that? Your disciples should not be picking grain on the Sabbath. Jesus goes, seriously? When David was king, he went into the temple on the Sabbath. He ate the consecrated bread because his soldiers needed the food. So what did they do? They continue to follow Jesus as Jesus goes to the synagogue. And then they pick out a guy who's just there to worship for all we know. He's there to worship. He's there to, to grow in his knowledge. But he's got a withered hand. And the Pharisees pick him out right away. And they say, Jesus, what about that guy? He's got a withered hand. Lived with it most of his life. Is it legal to heal on the Sabbath? They picked this guy out. They threw him under the bus. He was the experiment. Not because of him, but because they wanted Jesus. They wanted to take him down. 
And Jesus says, look at me, he says, look, which one of you, if you have a sheep and it falls in a pit, is not going to get it out on a Sunday? Which one of you encounters this is not going to do that on a Sunday? And he says to the man with the shriveled hand, extend your hand, and his hand is made well. And scripture says that it was at that point that the Pharisees looked for a way to kill Christ. For healing a man's shriveled hand on a Sunday, or whenever they celebrate the Sabbath, Saturday, if you will. John chapter 5, Jesus is by the pool in Siloam. There's a man who's been a paralytic for basically 38 years. 38 years this man has been an invalid. He sits by the pool because the theory is the waters get stirred. And when the waters get stirred, they have healing qualities and healing powers. And anybody who enters the waters can be healed of whatever it is that ails them. And he has been right by the pool for 38 years. He has been an invalid, but I don't know how long he's been by the pool, but it's been a long time. Because Jesus said, look, why don't you just get in the pool when it's stirred? He said, I'd love to, but guess what? I'm an invalid. I can't get in and out real easily. So every time they stir it, somebody hops in in front of me. You know what Jesus says? I'm sure he was thinking, don't worry about getting in the pool. He said, all right, pick up your mat, go for a walk. Just like that, the man was cured. But what does scripture say about that? Here's what scripture says about that. Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was what? Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Are you kidding me? Right? But he replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. I would have picked up my mat and walked too. I can't walk. I'm an invalid. I've been healed. And you're telling me you're worried about me picking up this mat because it's the Sabbath? Why is that important? Because the word of God has been misused and exploited for many years for personal gain and power plays. It happened in the day of Christ, right? These are the religious leaders and they were doing it. Let's not pretend it doesn't happen. And let's not pretend it only happens outside the walls of this church and it never happens in here. Oh man, just got real. Guys, we cannot and dare not take the word of God and use it apart from his will for personal gain. Sin is not what you think it is. Sin is not what you say it is. Sin is what God defines it as. Whether you like it or not, and whether you agree with it or not, and I'm in the same boat, guys, I don't always agree. And please understand, I'm not talking about the other guy here. I'm not preaching about the dangers of homosexuality or abortion or going to war or all the other things that people in church-going facilities like to throw at outsiders who don't have the Holy Spirit with them, right? It's not about taking these hot and button sins, giving us a moral high ground to stand out and call out other people. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about you. More so than that, I'm talking about me. Guys, I struggle with anger in my life. I really wish I didn't. Stupid stuff. Guys, I struggle with lust in my life. I wish I didn't. I'm just being honest. I wish these were non-issues for me. I wish I could read over those verses. I wish I could feel perfectly content in my soul of where I'm at, but I don't. My guess is neither can many of you. If we are being transparent, not with others, but with ourselves, can we really pat ourselves in the back for where our mind takes us when we give an honest assessment to ourselves on these issues? And guys, I'm just using these two issues of the many that Jesus touches on in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He talks about the reasons for divorce. He talks about reneging on an oath before God. He talks about kindness, not shown towards good people, but towards evil people in our lives. He talks about loving our enemies. Not loving those who are kind to us. He talks about loving our enemies, giving to the needy, not storing up treasure for ourselves, not worrying, not judging others. And when he talks about these things, you know what he says? You have heard it said this, but here's what I say. Right? These are all heart conditions brought about by Christ in this section of the scriptures. And there's a reason for this. There's a reason that it's so difficult for us to behold it in our lives. Guys, maybe you've heard the term self-actualization. 
Self-actualization, I looked up a definition, it refers to the need for personal growth and development throughout one's life. It's the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which was developed by the psychiatrist Abraham Maslow. Once you are self-actualized, you've met your full potential as an individual. That sounds really good, doesn't it? Full potential as a person. It's easy to see why this term is popular in our society, right? right? It refers to maxing out your potential as a person, as a human being. And it's something that it seems like we should all be striving for, right? Here's the problem. As a follower of Christ, you're beholden to yourself not to fulfill your potential as a human being, but to fulfill God and his potential living in you. That's who Christ created you to be. I think, here's what I'm getting at. I think we can all agree that our will and our desires don't always align with God's, correct? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to shake your head. But I'm guessing that if you're anything like me, your will and your desires don't always align with God's. I can tell you for a fact that it was never my will and it was never my desire to be a pastor. No, thank you. I would laugh in your face if you had said that 20 years ago. Literally laugh, literally in your face. And I'm using the word literally, literally. <laughs> All right? I had it planned out when I was a kid, man. Professional baseball player. That was a good track. Best case scenario. Worst case scenario, high school PE teacher. Look, I can deal with like 7 to 4 o'clock, Monday through Friday, summer's off. I am down with that. Right? That's all right. I can live with that. Didn't end up that way, did it? You see, I realized very early on in my life and in my faith, there's a couple of key concepts to God's will in my life. Here's some of the ones I have written down. First off, God's will is progressive. It builds on previous steps you've taken in faith. God's will may not be your will, but it will become your will. God's will is beyond your loftiest goals. God's will is always an act of faith. God's will will cost you something, and God's will brings peace on the inside and war on the outside. Guys, following God's will for your life is not always easy, but it is always necessary. As a follower of Christ, I'm beholden to my oath. When I said, Jesus, I want to give my life to you, I wasn't living on my own anymore. I was following God where he directed me. Here's what I found. God's will has always been preceded by learning and obeying God's precepts for my life, whether I agree with them or not. Guys, this passage we're here today forces us for introspection. It forces us to think about whether we want to, can, or willing, are willing to change our lives. It changes our perspective. It changes our faith. And then in turn, it does change our lives. Think about what I said at the beginning. When presented with their own mortality, 90% of the people chose to ignore it. They chose to not make any changes. They chose to not let it affect their lives. They chose to not enhance their life in the direction of it. Guys, I bring that up because I'm guessing the numbers are about the same for those who claim faith in Christ. Hear the word of God and allow the truth to change them. It's easy to show up here on a Sunday morning. What's difficult is allowing this word to work its way into your soul, in your heart, in your lives. Because it's not easy and it's not comfortable. Here's the thing that was really fascinating. We were at this seminar on Thursday. They had round tables. I think they had about eight chairs at each table. And we were, we had to travel further than just about any, so we were one of the last people to roll in. And of course, all the tables in the back are taken up, all the tables in the middle are taken up, so we sit in the very front, you know, with our back to the stage. You gotta turn your chair around to see the speaker and this and that and the other thing. There was, I think, four people at our table when we first got there. And the speaker did something at periodic times during the session. He would present a question. And he would say, if you do it as a table, that's fine. If you do it as groups within your table, that's fine. Maybe three or four people. Well, like I said, there was four people there. Laura and I made six. So the first time he said this, we kind of looked at them. And the other four people were all from the same church. They were all leaders and on staff at the same church. And we said, what do you want to do? You know, we kind of looked at each other. And, and one of the ladies in the middle said, all right, here's the split. It's you three, meaning Laurie, myself, and the lady beside Laurie, and then us. Okay, that's cool. You know, I thought we'd all go together, but that's fine. So we did our thing, went through maybe three or four of these sessions. The last time, and you'd talk for five minutes. The last time that, um, that the speaker said, here's what I want you to talk about, the subject he gave us was conflict in church or conflict in your workplace. 
Because basically one of the premises he dealt with is that conflict is inevitable, it's gonna happen. So what are some ways that you've dealt with conflict? So I shared, and then Laurie shared. And then the lady beside Laurie, when it was her turn to share, she looked at us and leaned in very closely and very quietly said, I can't share right now because of who's sitting at the table. Everybody else at that table is on staff at her church. Let's not pretend like it's somebody else's problem. Let's not pretend like these words are easy. Let's not pretend like these words don't deal with us. Let's allow these words of Christ to change us from the inside out. You have heard it said, but I say. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray that end. We pray that your words would change us. Not, not any power of persuasion or any slick speaking or any music. We pray that you and your Holy Spirit and your power would change us from the inside out. Make these words real in our lives. Convict us where we need convicted. Calm us and encourage us where we need calming and encouragement. But draw us closer to you through them. Help us to forget the cares and concerns and, and, and all the things that we have that we're worried about our image and simply help us draw unto you. Through your power and through your spirit, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ.